Hello there, my name is Phil Williams and I would like to welcome you to Audio Angling, the podcast site of fishingfilmsandfacts.co.uk. For me, this is a bit of a landmark occasion in many respects. Several weeks ago, I was invited to the Blackburn studio BBC Radio Lancashire by angling broadcaster Martin James to record a couple of interviews for his weekly programme at the water's edge. Today, in very blustery conditions, and with the farm much better working just over the way outside the little fishing hut we're tucked up inside of, on the banks of the River Ribble just outside Clitheroe, the tables are going to be turned on Martin as we explore his contributions to fishing for audio angling and for angling heritage. I choose the word contributions deliberately because over a long and very busy career, your links to angling across the whole spectrum have been very varied to say the least. So can we kick things off by setting the scene and exploring some of the many different strands running through your angling life, starting with your radio broadcasting? Well, the radio is very interesting. Uh, A lot of people know me through my programme, which started off as Hook, Line and Sinker on BBC Radio Blackburn when it first started. Uh, Later it became uh, BBC Radio Lancashire, and it was during my time at BBC Radio Lancashire that Radio 5 came on stream and I was approached by Radio 5 to do a programme every morning, Monday through to Saturday, usually about 6, 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning. It was very interesting, thoroughly enjoyed it and it was a big challenge because the challenge was I had to be somewhere in the world talking about fishing and wildlife and famous people. And it did take me all over the world. And the presenter in, back in London would say, it's now time to meet that man with more stamps in his passport than Douglas Hurd, who at the time was the uh, Foreign Secretary. And so he said, where are you today, Martin? Well, I could pop up in a little town in Oregon. I could pop up in a little place up in the Arctic Circle. Cambridge Bay, for instance, where you get huge, huge char, 15, 20 pounds, where you're living with the Inuits and you're having a great time. Or I could be in some little village in Sweden. Or over in Ireland, down on the west coast, I could be fishing for bass that morning. Or I could be talking to famous people like General Schwarzkopf and uh, other well-known people. Famous anglers like Lefty Cray, probably Lefty Cray is the greatest angler that the world has ever known. I always felt that it's a pity I could not get Dick Walker and Lefty Cray together because I reckon there we would have had a great working of great minds and no doubt we would discover new things in angling that would stand the angling world. But broadcasting for me really goes back to the wartime days really when I would listen to the wireless in the air raid shelter as the bombers come over at night and drop their bombs and uh, landmines and so forth and the batteries would be going and there was a, a very famous American broadcaster and his name escapes me Murray was I think his surname but he was describing the blitz for an American listeners back home. And uh, I said to my mum one day, I said, what he's describing, I said, is what we're seeing, mother. And so I was brought up on the radio. And after the war, of course, I started listening to other programs on the radio. One was where, about a Romany gypsy that roamed around the country. And he'd done these programs. And he'd done a particular program for Romney Marsh. And I wrote to him. And uh, I managed to spend a few days with him down on Romney Marsh. I just wrote to him, and uh, he wrote back, and he invited me down. And, well, we really never thought of anything wrong in anybody then. If you got an invite to go somewhere, you went. Today, if some stranger invited you to go, you wouldn't go. But I went, and I had a great time. And uh, he showed me how to uh, net eels and uh, out of Bedford Eels where you used a, a needle and some wool and you threaded the worms under the wool and uh, you just lowered it into the water on an old pole, piece of willow branch most times, and I would catch eels. And this went on then 
me love of the countryside and the environment for the rest of my life. I was always interested in conservation, always interested in helping other people. I was about ten years of age when my grandmother said to me, she said, I'd like you to get involved with some charity work with me and the other ladies from the church for Dr. Bernardo's. And I, thought, I said, well, what's Dr. Bernardo's? And she said, well, they're people that have lost their parents. And I thought that was very apt because I'd lost my parents in the war out in the Far East through the Japanese. I'd lost very, well, quite a few members of my family through the war, either killed on foreign parts or killed by bombs in this country. And I thought, yeah, that's a worthy cause. And so I, I started off then where we collect clothing around our village so we could take down to the, these boys at Dr. Bernardo's home at Yaldin. And there was another bonus for me, though, is that Dr. Bernardo's home was on the banks of the River Midway at Yaldin, and they got the whole of the field going down to the river, and I managed to get permission to fish there. So while my mates were on the other side, Mason Victory Angling Club side, where lots of anglers were, I was on the other side with one or two mates, fishing in seclusion, and of course, you always think the grass is green on the other other side of, side of the river or the field. And so that's how I started off in charity work. Then I joined the Army Cadets. Well, I first joined the Navy Cadets, but I didn't like them big flapping bell-bottom trousers. So I decided I didn't want the Navy Cadets. So I joined the Army Cadets, and there I had a great time. Been in there a year, and then we went to Langard Point in Felixstowe, up in Suffolk. A regular army camp went for a fortnight. I remember we was in these bell tents the first night and we had these boys crying, oh, I want me mum, I want to go home. And I thought, what a load of pansies. The following morning, Lieutenant Colonel Wiggins come round with his entourage of officers and the sergeant major and said, uh, everybody all right? And most of us said yes. He said, does anybody want to go home? I hear there's been some crying during the night in various, various tents. And there was a little forest of hands went up. I suppose 25% of us, of the boys, wanted to go home. So he arranged coaches. We got rid of them. And then we was down to the real boys. And we'd go on a rifle range and a bring gun range. We'd fire sten guns. But a great thing for me, there was a Sergeant Mapleston. And he used to go out onto the beach at night and fish. And he'd got two multiplying reels that he'd got from the States, and these were the -the state-of-the-art reels at the time. This is 1950. And so we went down on the beach, and he took me in, and he showed me how to rig up the gear, how to cast with the multiplier and everything. And uh, we was catching flatfish. I remember we caught a big sole one night, went nearly three pound, an absolute giant of a sole, and uh, we caught small schoolie bass. And when I caught my first schoolie bass, it was about, I suppose, a pound, no bigger. But that really did get me interested in in saltwater fishing, apart from the cod and the flounders, which I'd caught up to then. And so I moved on through the cadets. I reached the uh, rank of a sergeant. And used to go away on weekend camps, as well as uh, annual camps each year. Then it come to the time when one has to leave school and one has to take exams for colleges my parents wanted me to go in the Royal Navy I didn't want to go in the Navy but they insisted that I should take the Royal Naval College exam I did somehow I passed it I remember going before the board of officers there was five officers with all the all the medals and everything ranging from vice admirals downwards and I remember one of these gentlemen said to me, he said, I see you're an angler. Yes, sir. What spinner would you catch for roach? And I was disgusted to think that this man should think you're going to use a spinner for roach when we know they're bottom feeder and they feed on weed and nymphs and so forth. So I gave him a lecture for 15 minutes on the roach, telling them the Latin name and everything. And at the end of it, I think they'd got fed up hearing my voice and said, the chairman of the board said, any more questions? And they all said, no, it's time for lunch. 
I somehow got offered a place and I turned it down and uh, then I went off and uh, I'd done photography, journalism and working for a little local newspaper and gradually progressed from there. I went and worked uh, as a photographer. I suppose the highlight of the time then was I was probably 22, 23 and my editor said, we need to attract more youngsters into reading the paper. And I said, well, why don't we have a big angling competition amongst all the schools? So I organised a school's angling league. And in those days, editors realised that children sold newspapers. If a child was in the paper, then granny would want, uh, on both sides, would want a copy and aunties and so forth. So we organised this company and I'd have four to five hundred boys. Never any girls in those days, just boys. But what was really gratifying, we'd have 15, 20, sometimes 30 teachers that turn up with their teams and they'd help out. Two or three police officers would help out. St John's Ambulance Brigade or the Red Cross, they would turn up. And uh, we'd have these competitions on River Medway at Maidstone, between Maidstone and Tobble. And... On a Saturday morning, very, very early, Mason Borough Council would have a team of cleaners down on the riverbank, cleaning it all up, taking away all the rubbish, because the previous day there would have been a market. And it ran very well. We never had a spot of bother. And everybody enjoyed it. It ran for several years. And then the River Medway got polluted. And I said to the editor, I said, uh, we won't uh, be able to have a competition on Saturday, sir. What was that then, Martin? I said, well, the river Medway's been polluted. Do we not have another river? I said, well, we got the Kentish Stir, but I said, this is a long way to go, these boys. Book a fleet of coaches. And we had a coach company in, uh, in Chatham called Pilchards. Very apt name, I thought, for a coach company going to take a group of anglers out. And so we booked a fleet of coaches and we took them off down to the Stir and they caught fish. And that's what we had to do after that. Didn't cost the boys anything. The papers paid for it. And it ran very well. And during the weeks uh, leading up to these competitions, I'd go around all the schools. And then all the boys that were interested in fishing, they'd come into the main hall and then I'd give them a talk about how the league was going to be run and I'd show them a few pictures and so forth and explain these are the rules and these are what we have to fish by. And following on from that, Medway Borough Council asked me if I would organise some competitions for boys and girls during the school holidays. So I'd done that, and that worked very well, and we run it like uh, an FA Cup run. You know, you'd have rounds, and somebody, a few would qualify the next round, and so forth and so forth, till we got to a final when we ended up with about a dozen boys. That run very well. We had the support of the council, the mayor, and all that. And it was very gratifying that uh, after that ended... Uh, Medway Borough Council did actually dig a lake on some land and that lake now is uh, open for any any boy or girl or even man or woman to go and fish. I believe that every council owes it to their youngsters to have a place where youngsters can fish. Teach a kid to fish and they won't become a nuisance on street corners. They won't throw a rock through your window. They become better citizens. They learn to look after the countryside. They can tell different types of birds because they're learning the calls of the birds and the shape and colours of the birds and so forth. And they become conservationists. And I've been a conservationist all my life. I've tried to improve everything as I've gone. The ACA started in 1948 and I supported that. And I supported that right up to its demise, which is now the Angling Trust. And so the pollution arm of it's called Fish Legal, so I just joined that. But I suppose my boyhood and younger days were filled with fun, fishing and shooting. I got my first gun when I was 10 years of age. I remember 12 years of age walking through Rochester High Street with a single bore Cooey shotgun and a belt full of cartridges round me waist and a army rucksack on me back going to catch the train down to uh, sea salt of marshes to shoot ducks in the winter. 
and nobody batted an eyelid. Today, if you tried to do that, there'd be a dozen armed response crews immediately grabbing hold of you. But in them days, nobody bothered. We all had a pen knife, we all had a sheath knife, but we never stabbed anybody. We used them for what they was meant to be used for, for wilting things, for gutting things. If we were to got a rabbit, you shot a rabbit, the first thing you do, you got to punch it, so you got a good pen knife. And uh, there were times in, in, when we was at school, summer holidays, we'd go off down to the river camping for a week. Our parents didn't worry about us. They knew we'd be safe. I think the only thing my parents ever said to me when I was, like, before I was about 11 was, if I went off fishing, I had to be back before it got dark. But apart from that, no problems at all. But it, I was still allowed to go night fishing, but I had to go with an adult then days. And I used to go out on cliff marshes and catch wild carp, wildy type common carp. They weren't true wildies, but they looked like wildies. And there was common carp, and there was three, four, five pounds. A five pound was a big fish, it was a giant fish. But we'd fish pieces of floating crust and bread flake, and we caught our fair share of carp. And carp fishing actually oh, took over my life as regards fishing for several years. I uh, started out there, we wanted to catch carp. I remember one campaign uh, four of us made was using boiled potatoes, fishing a still water. And if you read all the books of old, they said parboiled potatoes. What a load of poppycock that was, because there's no way you could pull a hook through a parboiled potato. And bear in mind, in the old days of carp fishing, they was using treble hooks. So there'd been three times the power you would need to pull that treble hook through the potato. No, you needed soft-boiled potatoes. And so we baited up this lake, with five, six, seven pound of potatoes every night from the first of April, right through the season. If we were at college, somebody else would go. Whoever was not at night school and that would go out and bait up. And it was quite outstanding that we'd be at the waterside there in late April and we could pick up some stones and chuck the stones in the water and we'd watch the carp appearing from all corners of the lake down to the area where the stones are going. They'd got so used to the sand, the potatoes are going in, it was like a dinner bell. And I remember the first night of the season, June the 16th, was a Friday. And I'd said to my tutor, could I have the day off, sir? What for? I said, well, it's the first start the day of the fishing season. No, you will be in here. He said, you can go fishing the weekend. So I wasn't allowed off, but some of my mates did manage to get the day off, and they went up on the Thursday, and they started at midnight, and they fished through through Friday, never had a bite. I turned up about 7 o'clock Friday evening. What you caught? Nothing. Has anybody caught nothing? Oh, the man over there has had a ten and a half pound leather carp uh, on a bit of floating crust, but nothing. Have you seen any carp? No. No. So I tackled up. Aaron Bite Indicators, Mark IV Carp Rods, all the walker gear like, you know, we was disciples of walker. He was our leader. He was the man that we looked up to. He was our role model. And uh, we fished all through that Friday night, all through Saturday, nothing. Saturday evening, about six o'clock, I said to the lads, right, we're going to have dinner. Yeah, right, let's have all your food and I'll get cooking. So I made a big fire and I got the big skillet out and I cooked eggs and bacon and beans and sausages all the stuff you like when you're a boy and we had our dinner and a few mugs of tea and then we went back to our swims and was sitting there and sitting there and then I said to my mate I said do you realise Billy I said the smell of water mint oh yeah he said, it's strong ain't it I said we're going to catch tonight I always felt if I smelt the wet water mint the fish were going to feed don't ask me why just one of those things Anyway, midnight come, still hadn't had a bite. None of us had a bite. And I said, well, what's happened? What's happened to all these carp? You said, we put lots of potatoes in and we catch them. And I said, don't worry, we will. At 3 a.m., dead on 3 a.m. in the morning, the silver paper went up to the butt ring. I struck. I hooked the first carp. And as I'm playing it, the, me other rod went. So I laid the first rod down, opened the bar alarm, struck on this other fish, and then played that out, and then played the second out. And there, suddenly, I've got two double-figure carp between 10 and 11 pounds. So we put them in Essian sacks, which we used in no days because we never had nothing else. 
But thankfully, we never ever lost the carp through being in a Hessian sack. They all did live. And between then and 8 a.m. in the morning, or 8.30, I had 13 double-figure carp. The best was 12 and a half pound. It was unheard of in those days to catch this number of double-figure carp in a session. And my mates had to go around and borrow sacks off of other anglers like. And then the club up would be unlocked at nine o'clock. So we was able to weigh our fish then and put them in the book. And we would weigh them on shopkeeper's scale with the big brass pan where normally it'd be used for weighing out five pound of potatoes and things like that. And we weighed our fish and then we released them back in the lake. And to the best of our knowledge, they swam off strongly. I don't think, well, we never ever saw a dead carp, so it didn't do them any harm. And then, uh, we got a bit further forward and uh carp fishing. I wanted a 20 pound carp. And I was down in a, a milk bar one night with the lads and uh they was talking about going bowling. And I said, no, I'm not going bowling. I'm going fishing. Ah, oh, come out of bowling alley. Nah. And I had this girl with me like, and she said, we're going bowling. I said, no, we're not, love. We're not going bowling. I said, I'm going fishing. And there was a record at the time, Bye Bye Love, by the Everly Brothers. So I went and stuck a coin in the jukebox, picked it out, and played it. And as I walked back to her, I said, Bye Bye Love, just listen to the music. I said, I'm off carp fishing. And the lad said, you can't do that. I said, I can. I can get a girlfriend any day. But I can't catch a £20 carp, and I feel that I might get one tonight. And I did, I had a £20 carp, so it was well worth it. But in between... Course fishing, I, I also done sea fishing. I love sea fishing. All round the Kent coast, I reckon we had the finest sea fishing available anywhere in the United Kingdom in those days, the 50s into the early 60s. We could go down to the Kent coast, Ramsgate, Herne Bay, Broadstairs, Sheerness, which is in the Thames Estuary, Dungeness, Hythe, and we could be guaranteed at least one good cod on a night tide. Sometimes we'd catch a dozen good fish. Sometimes we'd catch a 20 pounder, 22, 23 pounder. It was incredible fishing. There was one instance when I'd been at the uh, local dance hall on a Saturday night, picked up this Judy, took her home like, and uh, as we were laying in bed chatting and having a smoke, I said to her, have you got a wireless? Yes, she said. I said, can I go and switch it on? Yeah. I went downstairs, I switched this wireless on, and I'm listening to the shipping forecast, and it says Thames, southwesterly, force eight, strengthening to nine. And I thought, I walked it's three o'clock in the morning. So I went back upstairs, and I said, you're right, I've got to go, love. You can't leave me like this. So I got to, I said, because the cod are going to be feeding. I said, I've got a brilliant tide. The wind's strengthening. I'm going cod fishing. So off we went down to, uh, oh, well, first of all, I phoned my mate up and he said, where are you? I'm at so-and-so. He said, I'll keep coming round your flat. I said, no, go round and pick up my beach casters and all. You know where everything is. Right. I said, then come round to me. I'm at uh, Seagull Close. And so he come round and picked me up, and off we went. And we went out, and we had quite a few. And I had my first twenty pound cod that night from uh, from the beach. Tremendous sea fishing it was. And the anglers I fish with, Frank Edmonds, Tom Hutchinson, dear me, uh, uh, who was the big lad who had the beach cast, who made the beach casting range? Oh dear me, Les Moncrief. Uh, and other great anglers of the past. Now, some of these people lived in Kent, but others came from London and further afield. And some of the finest beach anglers I did meet down on Dungeness and Hive Beach and the other places along Long Deal and Dover come from London. And they'd make that long trek there, but they were great, great beach fishers. And we all learnt from one another, streamlining our rigs. I had a friend in the Royal Air Force, and he took my pen squidders away and uh, chewed them right up. Well, you know, in them days, 
If you could cast 100 yards, that was a long, long way. Nowadays, people are casting 300 yards, but back in the 50s, it was 100 yards was the target you had to reach. Well, after a while, through the teachings of Les Moncrief and Tom Hutchinson, I was pushing out a lead 150, 175 yards. And we was getting our share of fish, and there was a place at Dungeness called the Dustbin. It's where the currents come and met one another and they created a big eddy and all this food would get swept in. And we used to use sea mice as bait a lot and it was like a big hairy slug. Brilliant bait, but what we would do, we'd listen to the forecast all the time and then suddenly we'd hear one lunchtime, we'd hear the weather forecast, southwesterly, so so so, dungeon S, uh, false 10, false 11. That night, whatever we was doing, we'd stop doing and we'd drive all the way to Dungeness with a load of buckets and then we could walk along the beach and pick up all the bait we wanted. Lugworm would be ripped out of the ground. And I'm not talking about little tiny lugworm, I'm talking a foot-long black lugworm. Be ripped out of the ground by the pounding waves. There'd be razor fish. You used to come home with buckets of razor fish and sea mice. And then that following weekend... That would be it. We'd drive down on a Friday, wouldn't return till Monday morning. I'd take me rifle, we'd probably shoot a hare or a couple of rabbits, we'd make a, build a Dutch oven, have a big stew, and that stew would stay hot all the time we was there, and we'd just go along with that mug, and everybody was invited to dip in. And oh, it, was, it was a great time to be alive. Uh, great fishing, great companionship. We never had a lot, but it didn't matter. We had friendship, and I think that's that's what it was all about. And in those days, I was into match fishing as well. We had a match fishing team, and we used to take part in the Angler Times Winter Leagues. And we used to travel up to Cambridge and fish the River Cam at Dimmock's Coat, which was a hell of a journey from Kent. And then we'd go across to the Witham and the Welland, and there'd be four or five hundred anglers fishing a match. Tremendous events they were where you could win a lot of money. I remember one year, me and uh, Jeff Bramham, we pulled all our winnings and everything, and at the end of the year we shared it out. Both Jeff and myself paid our mortgage off for a year from our winnings. That's how good it was. And we, at the same time, we're going down to the Hampshire Ave and the Dorset Stir. We're fishing the Medway, the Belt. We'd go up to the Thames, the Kennet, the River Lee. There wasn't a water, I don't suppose, that we didn't fish at some time or another, the Great Ooze. But it was hard driving, long drives. Simple reason it, we didn't really have any motorways at all. It was all sort of, uh, A roads and we never had the motors we had today. I remember. The one time we went up to Norfolk uh, for a long weekend. Two of us in a three-wheeler, reliant, my mate Ed. And we took our dogs, our guns and all our fishing tackle. We went up, left home Friday lunchtime. It was late on the Friday night when we got to Great Yarmouth. And I remember we pulled in this little field at Martham. And uh, we stored all the rods underneath. We kept their guns inside. And a pair of us slept in the back with our dogs. And uh, we'd done that again on the Saturday night, and we'd go, we'd shoot at dawn and dusk and fish during the daytime, and then we'd go to the local pub in the evening. It was all oil lamps in them days, and we'd go in and we'd have half a shandy apiece, and it'd have to last us all evening, like otherwise the old landlord might have said, well, it's, I think it's time you went, lads. And then um, we was up there one time for a week's holiday, and we're camping at Martham, and there was a big storm forecast and uh, there was this little hunchback gentleman and he got it he, he got higher boats higher dinghies like and he got a little shed where he sold food and bits and pieces of tackle and he said you're going to have a rough time in a tent tonight boys I said uh, yeah he said look I want to give you my key to my shop come shed you can sleep in there tonight now he didn't really know us except our visits up there but he trusted us and he could trust us because there was no no reason for him not to and so after that we never ever took a tent afterwards we used to sleep in this shop come uh, shed like where he had stored all his outboard motors and he had tins of food and everything 
And so as to help him out a bit, we wouldn't take any food up with us, we'd buy our food off of him. And we go to the local dance hall, Pop the Wire, and there'd be a dance hall there, and uh, it was a village hall, and there'd be a dance on a Saturday night. Well, us lads from London, aren't we? A bit of a bee's knees up there with our teddy boy suits and all the rest of it. So we'd go off there and we'd have fun. And I remember Tony Howe, he met a girl there and eventually married her. And uh, to this day, they're still happily married. I don't know how it lasted so long for Tony, but I did notice Tony, not un- not like us, he didn't fish so much. <laughs> now, in those early days, as you've already mentioned, your journalistic involvement was done at a fairly local level. But as we all know, it didn't remain that way. I suppose one of the highlights of my life, really, was being asked by Dick Walker to write his column in the London Evening Standard one week. And I said, I can't do that, Dick. Yes, you can, he says. Just write it as if you're writing a letter to your best friend out of fish for Big Bream in the South East. Now, we got to bear in mind that bream fishing in those days, a five-pound fish was a big fish, a very big fish. A seven-pound fish was a giant. The record was 12 pounds something from uh, Castle Lake in Kent. So, I wrote this article about catching big bream in the southeast and the river belt and the river medway. And this was winter time when we'd fish with the big bream, not the summer time when everybody thought that bream could only be caught. And that was another misnomer that me and my mates discovered was all wrong. All the books were saying bream were a summer fish, barbel were summer and autumn, and rudd were the same, and tench were the same. Again, it's a lot of poppycock, really, because I, I well remember fishing the river belt on Christmas Day in the 50s. I cycled all the way to the river, because Christmas to me didn't mean anything. Christmas to me was another day to be out fishing or shooting. And so I'd cycled down there, and I caught three tench. And I had to go up the pub, because up to the pub, there was in Hudson, there was a pub called the Boyne. And they would have the scales, the club scales. And I saw the landlord, and in those days, the pub didn't open on a Christmas day. And I said to him, could you do me a favour? What's that, young man? I said, could you come and weigh some tench for me? Yeah, certainly, boy, he said. If you travelled all this way, like I've cycled 15, 16 miles. You travelled this way, he said. Yes, I can do that. And he come down with the scales. And again, there was the old shop scales, the old brass pan and that. And we weighed these tench. And I won the Winget Angling Club Specimen Cup of the Year that year for these tench. And this was this was... December, they said you couldn't catch them. Yes, you can catch them, uh, especially on rivers. And uh, it was the same with the bream. And so we fished with these bream, and we caught lots of big bream. And our tackle was very simple. We'd use 15-foot cane rods made by Clarkson of Rochester. Brilliant rod builder, this guy was. And it would be a Tonkin cane butt, a middle joint, with built bamboo top joint. We use centre pin reel, six pound line. We use a big swan quill float and a board bullet as a weight stopped about 15 inches from the hook by a split shot. And we use a number six model perfect hook. And our bait was lobworm, either one or two big lobworms. And we make up a load of ground bait, bread and bran, make it up cricket ball size, and then cut a load of lobworms up and put them inside the bread and bran and drop them in the swim. And we'd leave our swims for at least an hour, wouldn't even attempt to fish, and then we start fishing. And we caught lots of bream, but what we also caught, we caught a lot of pike. We caught a lot of double-figure pike. I think the best fish we probably caught was 17, 18 pounds. But the beauty was, pike love worms. they pick up these worms because the river was flooded and belting through and all coloured. But if we was using a float. When we struck, we invariably we hooked the fish in the scissors and uh, so the pike couldn't bite the nylon line and we'd have some tremendous fights occasionally the pike got the got the hook inside his mouth and then he'd just bite us off but most times they take it but we also caught a lot of big perch the same way we'd be fishing these lobworms and a big perch come along two two and a half pound which are real big stripers in them days but yeah so 
I wrote this article in London Evening Standard. I remember it being published, and uh, it was in also in a, the local paper who had published it as well, and there's a picture of me, and I'm going up the dance hall on a Saturday night, up the pavilion at Gillingham, and uh, the girls are coming across, see your picture on the front of the paper, mine? I said, yeah, cool, you're writing for the London papers now, then. And the London Evening Standard in them days, like, was selling seven or eight million copies a night. And I said, yeah, but it was a wonderful chat-up chat up talk for the girls. <laughs> So, uh, at the same time, I was writing for Cham Ross Union News, the Kent Messenger Group of newspapers. Uh, I was writing for different newspapers in South London. And uh, I was doing a bit of stuff for the Angling Times. And I'd done a little bit of stuff for a Fishing Gazette and the Angler's News. Then uh, the Angler's Mail hadn't started in them days, and then I started uh, doing a bit of stuff for Angler's Mail. And I remember getting a call from Angler's Mail that a person had caught a £25 River Medway carp at Tunbridge. Would I go down and photograph it? So I said, yeah. So I went down there, found this angler, went along the bank where this carp was, and uh, found the carp tethered by a length of nylon line about 50 pound breaking strain through its mouth and through its gill and pegged on the bank well that poor old carp was nearly dead because the nylon line had ripped its gills to bits I didn't take the picture I refused to take the picture and uh, the guy was lucky he didn't end up in the river himself and I uh, found the nearest phone box called Angler's Mail and told them, and I said, I'm not taking the picture, and the reasons why, I said, I think we should use the story. Thankfully, they had the common sense to use the story, and so hopefully that person never, ever fished again. If he did, he wouldn't have fished any club water, hopefully. But that was a very, very sad time, but most times when I was called out to photograph big fish, it was it was memorable because you was seeing a big fish in its flesh. You was meeting the angler. You was also you was learning how he caught it and where he caught it from. So that would be locked up in your mind and think, ah, oh, remember that sometime. And then angler's mail started, and then the, the monthly magazines, course fishermen, course angling, uh, done bits for them over the times, but. I've not been such a, a great writer as more a photographer. Though, when I did uh, start to branch out, I did do a lot of work in Scandinavia, magazines and American magazines. Uh, of course, I've done a lot of stuff for American newspapers and magazines on fishing and outdoor life and wildlife and things like that. Uh, a lot of wildfowling stuff I used to write about as well in shooting magazines, which I enjoyed. I always felt that I could capture capture the chase uh, a lot better than I could capture the fishing bit. The thought of uh, going out and geese hunting and duck hunting at dawn and dusk and uh, battling through snow drifts and all this like, I could seem to be able to capture that better. Thoroughly enjoyed that. While I was in the States, I was doing a lot of TV work and radio work. Uh, I got offered a job to work for Canadian Broadcasting Corporation at one time. And uh, I thought about it very strongly, but decided against it. And there has been quite a bit of tackle consultancy work too. I've been very fortunate that I field tested uh, lots of tackle for lots of companies. Back in the late 50s, Ackles and Pollock, steel rods, taper flashes... Oh, wonderful rods, and uh, I field tested them and uh, reviewed them, and uh, I must admit, they're very, very good rods. they done the job nicely. Occasionally somebody will break one, but I think really they broke it through their own stupidity and not because of the materials. Then I, I uh, field tested various Abu products, especially their, their multipliers for saltwater f- beach fishing, the 7,000s and the 8,000s and 9,000s for boat fishing, but I always felt my pen squidders were the top of the tree when it come to my beach fishing, until I was given two Abu 7,000s, 
and as soon as I got these Abu Turret 7000s I realised they were super real and I passed them over to an engineering friend of mine I said we you just uh, have a good look at them and tune them up for me and he did and I used them reels for years and years afterwards until they were stolen in a big burglary in my house but they was wonderful reels the 7000s I've still got the Abu 5500s and I've got the Abu 6000s which I still use mainly for my pike fishing. And they were very good. And then uh, I was with greys for a while, when greys were greys. When greys made British built rods, where they built the blanks in this country and not in the Far East. And when I was there, I worked with their rod designer, who was a great guy that had retired and come back. And we made a range of rods. We made a big fish float rod. We made a che- what we called the Chevin, which was a rod designed for four to seven pound lines, which was perfect for roach and bream and tench. And we done a barbel rod, uh, designed for eight to twelve pound lines. And, uh, these rods sold, sold very well, and uh, they fetch a very good price on eBay today. But I must admit, in my car now, there's a Chevin and two barbel rods. And, uh, on one of them rods is a Mitchell 300 reel 1953 version with the butterfly anti-reverse which uh, I was given by my parents in 1953 I'm still using it and these rods probably be 15 years old now I'm still using them I see no reason to change but where I am very fortunate I believe is that I was approached by Thomas and Thomas rod builders of Massachusetts Greenfield Massachusetts Several years ago now, more years than I can care to remember. And uh, how I met them was they were sponsoring the World Fly Fishing Championships and I was fronting all the television interviews for the various countries taking part in the championships. And what happened was there was one TV crew uh, with me interviewing all the team captains and so forth and covering the events. And during this time I met Trevor Bross, of uh, TNT, and he's got a little rod with him, and he's, I said, that's a nice little rod, Trevor. He's catching a nice grayling on that. Would you like to try it, Martin? I said, yes, please. And I tried it. And at the end of the week, I gave it back to him, and he said, no, you can keep that. I said, oh, thanks very much. And uh, 18 months later, I got a call from Trevor. We would like to invite you and your wife over to our factory, Martin, for a couple of weeks. Take your fish in, and arrange somebody to take your wife shopping, and all that, and let you have a look around. And I said, oh, yeah, that'd be nice. So I said, well, what you want? And we don't want nothing. We'd just like to, like to show you what we got. And I said, well, there's no such thing as a free lunch. He said, well, in this case, there is. So we went across, and we had a fortnight over there. And I was very impressed with the whole setup in the factory. Everything on a Thomas Thomas rod is made by Thomas and Thomas, even the winch fittings, whereas all the other companies usually buy the winch fittings from other companies. The only thing on a Thomas and Thomas rod that wasn't American was the cork handle, which come from Portugal because that's where the cork trees grow. And I was so impressed with the dedication of the staff and the quality control and everything. And uh, we go off stripe by fishing in off Cape Cod and all this, and we go trout fishing. Oh, and we had a great time, real great time. And I was sorry to leave when we did leave. And then I'd been home a little while, and then I got a call from Trevor a day, and he said, we'd like you to join our pro staff. And I said, well, what does that entail, Trevor? And he said, well, you use our gear, and, and uh, you help us with design of new rods, and, uh, you know, if you see something that could be improved, and so forth. So I've been with them now for many years, and I have a very happy relationship with them, and I get to use what I think and consider are the best fly fishing rods in the world so what more can I say and for the rest of my days here I am 75 still using them behind us in the cabin as we talk there's a, a rod made up so when we finished here I can walk across the river and cast a fly catch another fish on a TNT rod and let's not of course forget the books I'd offer, I've been offered the chance to write a book on angling but I felt that uh, I didn't want to write a book on angling. 
all the books on how to catch them had been done and done and done again and overdone. And how many words can you write about catching a carp nowadays? If I wanted to write a book, I wanted to write a book about things that have happened through my life. So I got the offer to uh, write a book about my life, an autobiography, if you like, by Crowwood Press. And uh, I still wasn't sure whether to do it. And at the time, I was I was vice chairman of Crossroad Care, which is a charity organisation where uh, if somebody's uh, caring for somebody 24 hours a day so that carer can have a better quality of life, Crossroads Care put a trained carer into the house for a day or two days or a week to give that person a break. And we was at uh, a meeting one Tuesday evening and uh, the government had cut back some funding. So I said, right, I said, well, what I'll do is I'll write my autobiography. I've been offered the chance to do it. I said, but I didn't know really whether I want to do it. But I said, now nah, there is a real cause. So I'll do it. And I remember Lady Clivero saying, Martin, you got enough problems as it is. She said, in a wheelchair and all this. And now you're going to write a book. I said, yes, I will. Anyway. Six months later, the book was finished. Nine months late, it was published. And we had the launch in the House of Commons. And a coach I took a coach load of people down from uh, the Ribble Valley. I chose to take the parents of three mentally retarded children who Crossroads were offering help to. I took two nurses from the hospital when I first went into hospital and was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. Back in the uh, back in the late sixties, early seventies, can't remember the date. I think it was about nineteen seventy three. I think I don't too certain on that. I trace these nurses. I used to attend a physio handicap centre for a couple of years, and I managed to trace the manageress there and her husband, and I invited them. Uh, my doctor come, the local newspaper editor come. Oh, oh, coach load of people. Lady Clithero come. And uh, we had a great day out. And uh, the book sold and it raised a lot of money for Crossroad Care. Uh, not only that, it made people aware of Crossroad Care because I had a chapter. The last chapter in the book was the history of Crossroads. So uh, the front cover picture of that book was me sitting in the middle of a river, chest eye waders, fly fishing. And the back cover picture was a picture of me water skiing in Florida and I'm saying you can be like that one day and you'll be like that another day so while I was uh, the physio handicap centre was very good because I was I was doing disabled games there I was playing table tennis shot put discus and javelin and when you're pushing a wheelchair around you build up some muscles but I was very fortunate I won a few gold medals in uh, javelin and discus the shot put that was a bit harder so I, I, I won a couple of bronze Table tennis, I could never, ever win a game of table tennis. I'd win the first game, first set, and the other bloke would win the next two. I could never actually win a game. But I used to like it. I sometimes reach for the ball and the wheelchair would turn over. <laughs> They'd have to come and pick me up. And I'd say, you all right? Yeah, go on, carry on. And, yeah, I enjoyed that. And while I was doing that, I'd done another fundraising job. I uh, remember the Fishing Handicap Centre wanted members, some of the older members wanted some carpet bowls. And I said, we don't have no funding for it. So at a sports club meeting one Thursday evening, I says, you buy the carpet bowls, order the carpet bowls, I'll pay for them. How can you do that, mine? Don't worry about it. I'll sort it out. You just order the carpet and the bowls, all that. So I'd read in the Angling Times a bloke had fished non-stop in a wheelchair for 50 odd hours. I suppose some so called world record, I don't know what it was, but it didn't matter to me. I thought, well, I can beat that. I thought, ah, oh, that's how I raise the money. I'll get sponsors. Let people sponsor me so much an hour. So we did. Now I'd done this sponsor thing and I fished 80 odd hours. How I'd done it, I don't know. I, I, Bernie Calvert of the Ollis Pop Group had a, a nice little lake and he used to let me fish it. And I said to him, could I do a sponsor fishing here? 
He said, yeah, come scan, Martin. And it, it worked out very well and I turned up and the first day I caught some bream and a pike and then the weather changed. Cold, frosty nights and here I am sitting in a wheelchair, can't get a bite, couldn't get a bite at all. Never had another fish over the rest of the time I was there. But uh, the manageress of the uh, Physical Handicap Centre would turn up just after dawn with some hot bacon sandwiches and an hot flask of coffee and that used to cheer me up. And then the fire brigade or the police would turn up at night or during the day and then lots of other people would turn up. I think we raised about £1,100. So they got their carpet bowls and the club got some more funding. So that was well worth it, but I must admit I was a bit shattered. And then I done another sponsored job up on Loch Kenny, Scotland with Andrew Gallagher. Uh, Andrew was a real fit guy. Late he joined the... Uh, army as an intelligence officer and he was very very good at his job but we went up a lot can and we fished for a month and we was uh, being sponsored so much per pound of fish I think we raised 1500 pound on that trip we had this caravan on the banks of the lock and Andrew would wheel me down to the water's edge and get me in a wheelchair into this boat that we'd been loaned I remember the Daily Express come up to do a feature and uh, they'd done this feature of us. I remember the photographer, no, the author, writer, he was fishing with a little spinning rod, and he'd bait up with worm and lob it over the side and lay the rod on the side of the boat. Well, as the boat rocked, the rod would bend down or it would give slack line, depending what way the boat was moving. And he kept saying, I've got a bite, I've got a bite. And I thought, that ain't a bite, mate. No chance for a bite. But he'd done a very good feature, like, and the photographer was very good. And then the following week in his column, he said, I oh, recently was up Loch Ken, he said, and uh, fishing for the roach, he said, and elderberries. This is the time you want to be here with elderberries. He said, I caught a tremendous amount of roach. Me and Andrew scoured that luck side. The following day after that feature, of it, we could never find that uh, elderberry bush. Never. So... I think that might have been in his imagination he caught these hundreds of roach. <laughs> but yes, writing, so yeah, Up Against It, very good book. The copies are occasionally available on the internet like second-hand copies. They fetch a good price in the States. One copy sold for over $200. Uh, I don't know why it was so special to that person, but that person wanted it, so. My recent book is At the Water's Edge. And I've titled it At The Water's Edge because that's where I've had the happiest moments of my life. Whether it's been shooting, which often took place at the water's edge when I'm after ducks and geese, or whether I've been fishing. Sea fishing, game fishing, course fishing. I don't have a favourite fish. They're all the same to me. I just love every one of them. And whatever I'm catching at the time, that's the most important fish for me that particular time. And... uh it's taken me all over the world. I've been very fortunate to uh, fish the World Bone Fishing Championships, coming in third place, which I considered quite an achievement when I'm up against all the Americans that are fishing with a bone fish all the time. I've uh, I fished up in uh, Lapland, and re I remember going the first time up in Lapland, taking the place apart with pike on the fly. Never been done before. They'd organised this competition, a uh, lure fishing competition, and they asked me if I'd fish it, and I said yes. I said, but I'd like to fly fish. Well, we don't have a fly fishing section. I said, well, I'd like to fly fish. And I remember I'd got this Swedish gentleman, as me guy, gilly-like, to row the boat, and we went out, and he was disgusted that he'd drawn me this man that chucks chicken feathers into the lake when we come back in lunchtime when he should have changed over with another bloke to take me for the afternoon session after lunch he refused, oh no he said I'm going back out with mine he said it's fascinating, you watch him he puts this big fly on and he casts it right over the water and then we watch the pike coming across the water attacking it yeah and that really did take off. And I remember due, later during that week, our guide said we'd been out all day long. We come back to our cabin about seven o'clock, having some dinner. 
It was about nine o'clock, and we'd had, a, I must admit, we'd had a few drinks, and uh, we was a bit light-headed. He said, do you want to wanna go fishing? Because midnight sun, you go fish all night, like. So I said, no, I said, oh, I think I want to get my head down. Well, my mate Bodsworth said, no, come on, let's go. So I said, no, Jimbo, I said, we're no fit state to go. Yeah, let's go. He said, Jimmy will do the driving. So, oh, all right, I said, let's go. So we went out, and Kent Sheringham, a friend of mine, had made me some little imitation frogs out of balsa wood, because I always reckoned they would be a good lure for pike, and you could fish them on a fly rod. So we went to this uh, big salmon river, big brawling salmon river, and I bodged just one side of the river and I'm the other side, just down from a bridge. And I remember casting out this big fly, uh, this big frog pattern, and bringing it up in little jerks, and suddenly this huge mouth come out the water, big, big head, smacked straight on top of this frog, and I tightened, and off it went. I reckon it's probably 20 minutes before we got that. I'm using a 10 weight fly rod as well. Before we got that pike in to the margins. And of course, we never had a net big enough. We never, and we wouldn't think of using a gaff. So I'd called Bodsworth round and Jimmy had guide, he'd come down. So I chucked in my walkproof camera, hoping he wouldn't drop it, and he didn't. I said, you better get some pictures of this, Jimmy. Anyway, uh, he did get some pictures. And when, Bob's got in the water and he got his hand under the gills of this fish and he lifted it and lifted it and lifted it and this pipe was coming up it was longer than me. Or it seemed to be. It was absolutely huge. And we done a couple of more pictures and it weighed 28 and a half pounds. And uh, then we watched it swim away. And I remember the following year when we were out for the Lapland World Cup and the World Fly Fishing Championships that were being held out there at that time. And I walked in a shop, and there was big cutouts of me holding this pike. <laughs> and it was quite a talking point out there, but I did get a lot of pike. And a lot of, a lot of television programs out there for Swedish television on uh, fly fishing with pike as well. Really was a good way of doing it. But it wasn't new to me, because we'd been catching pike. I caught my first pike on the fly from the river belt back in the 1950s. We didn't have much trout fishing down south in them days in Kent, but we uh, we got some perch and pike, and they would take flies, so that's how, that's how I used to do it. But I was very fortunate that uh, my grandfather and my father would take me up to River Kennet, and uh, so we could fly fish with the trout, and then they got across to the Wye. Uh, they used to fish on the River Wye for the salmon. I remember my grandfather, he... Just after the war it was, he bought what he called a new fangled machine, a multiplier, for spinning. Up until then he always used his all-cock centre pin for spinning. And it was a day not suitable for fly fishing, and so he was spinning. And he kept getting bird's nests with this, this multiplier. And I remember him saying to the ghillie, these new fangled machines from America, he said they're rubbish. And he took his spinner off, wound the line on it, Ran the line back on the reel, unscrewed the reel, chucked it straight out in the middle of the river. And uh, delved in his tackle bag and pulled out his uh, centre pin reel and put that on. And he stayed with that centre pin reel till he passed on. Then I, the centre pins came to me and I use them and I still use the centre pins today. There's something about a centre pin that you seem to be in charge all the time, especially when you're float fishing. But back to books. Up against it... <clears throat> I decided, yes, I'll write that, and uh, we can use it to raise funds for the Army Benevolent Fund, which is the Soldiers' Charity. It's very interesting to note that the Soldiers' Charity is to help all soldiers, even going back to the Second World War. Health for Heroes, very good, good organisation, raise a lot of money, but the money is being spent on renovating buildings and so forth for injured soldiers. Oh, this is all wrong. That is the government's job to do that. That money that we raise through Help for Heroes, which I've raised through doing sponsored guiding and all that, should be going to the troops themselves and their families. And uh, that's that's a thing that many of us disagree with. And uh, now, as we're talking now, I notice the newspapers have also highlighted this. But the... Uh, the ABF, that's for all soldiers, whoever they are. 
and they do a very fine job. So I feel proud to make my little donation, same as I do with Crossroads and uh, as I do for St Dunstan's for the Blind. They're my three charities. I get asked for money from other charities and I just say to them when they rattle the box, I'm very sorry, but my charities are so, 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 so. I said I can only afford so much. You know, we can't support everybody even if we'd like to. Uh, I recently read somebody's just won £110 million pounds or something and I was sitting down the river actually having a sandwich the other day thinking to myself, right, if I had that money, what would I do? Oh, I know what I'd do. I'd give two million to the ABF, two million to Crossroads, two million to Dunstans for the Blind. I'd make sure my children's education was taken, the grandchildren's education was taken. I'd make sure my children uh, were taken care of and so forth. And then I'd probably go travelling around the world fishing. Probably spend a lot of time in the Bahamas chasing bonefish. <laughs> Because your story still has so much which deserves to be said, rather than either trying to compress it during the editing stage, or simply skipping over chapters in an attempt to work it into a more manageable size, I feel sure that it would serve everyone's purposes far better if we conclude temporarily at this point, and resume the story as a second episode, if that's okay with you.